Hey, Owen. Hi there. How you doing? Can you hear me okay? Uh, I can hear you great. I'm just going to... Great. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Sorry for the moment uh, moment delay. I had to switch my Zoom account around, and sometimes it takes a little bit of shuffling. You know what it's like, right? It's it's the Zoom black hole where you have like just this little <laughs> bit of latency, and someone's just waiting, and like I guess they're in the room. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. The Zoom black hole. I've never heard it called that before, but that's a, that's a great... That's a great name for it. I love it. I made it up just awesome. now, so <laughs> it's convenient. <laughs> I'm writing that down. It's becoming something I'm going to use every day. I love it. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about yourself and your organization and uh, what you're passionate about. We'll go from there. Sure. Um, so I'm Owen Muir. I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. And um, I, there are kind of two organizations of note. Uh, one of them is the medical practice that I co-founded, Brooklyn Mind Psychiatry, and mm -hmm. the other is Sphere, which is a new kind of insurance company or third-party payer, essentially, for vertically integrating mental health payment models with uh, care delivery in the highest risk vertical. Did you say Fear? F-E-A-R? No, Sphere. Oh, well, in, sorry. Yeah. What a crazy name for an insurance well, company. I mean, actually, it's a pretty accurate name for an insurance company. We're terrified bad things will happen. This is how we hedge our, our against existential dread. I can see um, the I can see the ads up against Geico. Fear. <laughs> yeah, we're calling it like it is, not like these Geico. We're being, we're being authentic. It's our authentic. authentic selves. Yeah. The, uh, we're big fans of authenticity, and um, one of the issues at um, that I think like we wanted to address was fear. The, the name comes from – it's an homage to ambit, which is a word that means sphere of influence. It's also the name of the supervision model from the Anna Freud Center that we base everything on, adaptive mentalization-based integrative treatment, ambit. Um, and so – you know, as a kind of hat tip to our spiritual uh, guides at the Anna Freud Center, as it were. Um, that's how we got that name. So, and you're a musician too with peers because uh, you've got a ton of instruments behind you as well? Yep. So um, I am a musician and my first line of work was as a recording engineer at Sony Music Studios. Mm -hmm. um, and in my, back when I was, you know, not doing mostly telepsych, I had a bunch of guitars in the office and I found people loosened up a lot more than diplomas. So, yeah. uh, you know, for this particular setup, it's keyboards and, you know, in the next place, who knows what, but it's not diplomas. That's for sure. Things you can play with, right? It's like having Lego blocks, right? I mean, it's, it, 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 is. Sort of pull, it just pulls out. I mean, if you think about it, yeah, I mean, it's the audible, visual, kinesthetic, it, it sort of it attacks all things. Because what do you do? What do you do with diplomas on the wall? Nothing, right? You just look Nothing. at them and go, you know, you, are those even real? <laughs> you look at them and you feel bad because you don't have them. And this guy does. What's also nice about it is when you're working with kids, you can kind of use the sounds, especially on an analog synthesizer, to get to feelings that aren't very good. And right. so if you're not getting it, you're like, well, is this? Uh, that's it. That's the feeling. Oh, okay. So it was very worse cool. than I thought. Like a lot worse. Oh, okay. Um, and, and that's a way to, to get on the same page with a kid in a way that's fun and mm -hmm. doesn't rely on well-developed language skills and not for nothing codes is interactive complexity. Um, right. so even in Medicare billing, that's an extra $15 per visit. Wow. <laughs> um, well, tell me, so, so you want to, you want to talk about mental health, like yeah. late on me. I, you know, the, the long and short of it is uh, mental health care is really important and not available practically um, right. for, for a bunch of reasons. Um, so I thought when I became a psychiatrist, uh, I thought the problem was going to be, you know, how am I going to be good enough to make a diagnosis and find the right treatment? Because, of course, we're going to have all the treatment options and that's not going to be the problem. It's, right. you know, really being a good enough doctor and studying hard enough and really... And then I met third-party payers and mm -hmm. insurance companies and uh, had the experience of working with transcranial magnetic stimulation um, and the accelerated version thereof, along with some really effective psychotherapies. And I went, hold on, we're doing this all wrong. Mm -hmm. You need teams full of people because this is healthcare 
and you wouldn't walk into a neurosurgical OR and go, well, there's one dude here kind of spinning a yeah. scalpel. This will be cool. Let's say let, let, he'll run the anesthesia too. It'll be great. Save some money. With confidence seeing something like that, right? <laughs> well, I, you know, there, there are uh, about 56,000 on average brain cancers a year um, that uh, lead to death. There are about 363 cases or 363,000 cases. Ballpark. Mm. Um, last year, opioid deaths alone, overdose deaths, rose to 81,000, right? And so oh. this, that's the first leading cause of death in young people. And the second is suicide. Mm -hmm. So putting those two together, way more people are dying from, you know, less localizable problems in the brain than are dying from brain cancer. And yet we treat brain cancer as, you know, that guy's a brain surgeon, <laughs> Like, yeah. That's amazing, um, and and the, the the doctors and teams that would take care of people who want to die aren't given the same access to technology, aren't given the same regard in the medical community, and we have more deaths to deal with, more morbidity and mortality. Um, and so I really uh, had to take a step back from the I'm going to be some great psychiatrist thing, and looked at like systems of care that were mm -hmm. routinely failing my patients. What did you find? Well, um, so it, it led to me doing a really deep dive into like, why is this so messed up? So we started pushing on the system in ways that are a little bit like Neo in the matrix. Like what happens if you stop believing the spoon is a spoon? We'll so, bowing in, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah well, yes. Right. So d the, the insurance company denies coverage for drug and the mm -hmm. patient meets medical necessity criteria. So ah, I guess I'm stuck. Well, what happens if instead of saying, I guess I'm stuck, you say, call the attorney general of the state and submit an appeal and then right. submit another appeal and then submit another appeal and then submit another appeal and then get to external appeal and have a committee of external independent reviewers review the data and agree with you that the treatment you're prescribing is medically necessary. It turns out not only do the insurance companies have to pay for medically necessary treatment, they have to pay for it in retrospect. They have to pay my full rates. Right. And right. they can then be forced by the attorney general of the state in New York, in which, in which I live, to cover it for everybody. So instead of being powerless and just having to accept that this was kind of hopeless – I said, well, wow, <laughs> the matrix is a lot squishier here than it was over there, right? This is, there's a landline over on, on that one, but you know, I, I haven't seen the matrix in too long. Um, yep. But it is like, so, it's, yeah. it's, it's terrible for the individual who's going through this, but yep. in the end, it sounds like it was a good thing, right? Well, you had to go through. So we had to go through all sorts of rigmarole, but our patients got the care they needed on average. And right. You know, we said, look, we're just going to do this and see what happens. We win 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When well, yeah, we, because it's obvious, right? I mean, it's, it, but it's like, why can't they make the decision at the very beginning? I mean, what's stopping it? Like, who is with the insurance company? I mean, don't these guys know what they're doing? I uh, mean, yes. <laughs> yes, they do. And, and we've worked rather closely with some third party payers. Cigna is a good example. We're in network with Cigna. The entire practice is in network with Cigna because mm -hmm. I angry tweeted at their at their Twitter account. <laughs> they, <laughs> we had some like Twitter is the secret weapon of healthcare because it's, it's funny, isn't it? It's like you use all of their regular channels, nothing happens. Nothing, but if you you're tweet dead. something, it's like bam. <laughs> mm, I got a call at eight fifty five in the morning from a medical director at Cigna, and I was like, "This the workday hasn't even started yet." Maybe I should actually listen to what this guy's saying. And I, I, I reviewed the email I sent after the – it was embarrassing. I was very mm -hmm. obnoxious. I'm, I, I apologize to this day. Um, and so I don't know that it's ill will. I think there are certain really important to understand factors that make it so effed up. The first mm -hmm. of which is legally they have to act in this totally bizarre way, which is we made it the law as mm -hmm. the you know lawmakers in America – Mm -hmm. That insurance companies, health insurance companies, have to have a cap on their 
percentage of profits. Mm. So they can only make 15 to 20% profit margin. Mm -hmm. What well, that sounds, oh, we're keeping the robber barons away. How do you make that right. number go up? Mm -hmm. This is a basic math question I'm asking you. Me? Yeah. I'm, how do you, if you can only make 20%, how do you make more money? Uh, I don't know. If you can only make trade, you have to prescribe more, right? I mean, you've yeah, got to do more. Yeah, yeah, make the number more. go up. It's not, that's not hard, right? Um, if there's more expense, you'll make more, 20% of more is more. Yeah. Um, and so they figured out ways to do that. And they legalized graft and kickbacks. We call that pharmacy mm. benefit managers and safe harbor laws. They made it legal to pay the CEO of a public hospital more money in his pocket or her pocket or their pocket if right. they buy more expensive medicines and supplies all from one place. That's called a general purchasing organization, providing a rebate to a hospital CEO who gets gold status by buying 80% of their stuff or more from that one distributor. So right. normal saline is $1,000 a bag for salt water. Jeez. Epinephrine, $1,000 a, a dose. Like right. ancient, <laughs> as old as well, we get well, medicine. Why, we, why have we made this all so complicated? I mean, who's behind all this complication? Is Us. it just people like, what's that? Us, we are our, we're, law, we're our lawmakers on purpose. Oh, our lawmakers. Okay, passed laws that I mean it's complicated, right? Twenty percent sounds like we're they're not making uh, obscene profits. We wouldn't want that. Yeah. They're just charging yeah. obscene amount, obscene amounts to make more profits, but the same percentage. Mm -hmm. So that's a natural so, consequence of choices we made as an elected government and you know lobbyist working on that right but so everything comes that. back to government basically so it, it, it's funny because that, that seems to be a a case of, of like if you keep following the threads of almost all the problems we have in society we get back to the point where some lawmaker somewhere has done something that you know sounded good but then mm -hmm. you know once you follow it all the way through and you look at all the unintended consequences it's ended up with sort of disaster for a lot of people yes yes yeah. and and this is really a, you know, people are really good at figuring out stuff. Like you give them the, the rules and they'll play by them. Oh yeah. And when you make the rules just a little bit wrong, things can go really off the rails. Mm -hmm. And for example, mental health care, if you do it right, that reduces costs in the system. Uh-oh, <laughs> we better not let that happen. So- um, We don't make any money out of it. If it reduces well, costs in the system. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's only gonna it's only gonna lose us money to take great care of people. Yeah, of course. Now there's some there's some sections of the market where that's not true, because not everyone is covered by a fully funded insurance plan where this holds true. Mm -hmm. um, and some people are in uh, are are poor <laughs> essentially and are dual eligible Medicare or Medicaid. They're sick and they're and they're they do not have resources. And for those individuals. It makes sense to save money because all you're doing is essentially burning money um, right. when you don't address problems. And in in most, not most, but like 95 million Americans are covered by insurance, which is actually paid for by their employer. Yeah. And they want their employees to be well and back to work. There is insurance on those insurance plans. This is where so it's called reinsurance and stop loss insurance. That's what's called a secondary insurance market. Keep in mind, I'm a psychiatrist trying to get my patients care covered. Oh, no, no, no. But you have to be fully right. versed <laughs> in all of this, well, which is it, insane. <laughs> right? So um, I teamed up with, with people in, in healthcare broker land um, and some of the healthcare hackers, essentially. There's a group, uh, Benefits DNA and the uh, the... Um, the Ro the healthcare Rosetta uh, crew essentially, and they are dedicated to kind of having a fiduciary responsibility understood in their role as health insurance brokers, uh, similar to how you would have a financial advisor have a fiduciary responsibility to actually give you good advice. And they both work on commission, right? And so if you you. Right. If the, they get more commission for doing a crappy thing, they're not acting in your best interest. <sighs> so I teamed up with the good guys, and um, 
and started figuring out like, how can I get the care I provide to the people it's worth a lot to without it costing the patients a lot or even any money? And it turns out like it's cheaper to take great care of people and charge them nothing than it is to do it the other way around. But the people for whom it is cheaper and saves money are actually in the end capital markets because you have a stop loss insurance carrier who tranches off risk in life, health, disability, own occupation, disability, all these risk pools, right? And we recognize this from the big short, right? This is the housing market all over again, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those high risk uh, mortgages. Um, we do the same thing with health insurance and life insurance and disability. And we sell it off to Berkshire and Cerberus and other capital management companies. Um, and so what we, we realized is like looking at the array of healthcare expenses, the only meaningfully modifiable sources of long-term disability and, you know, your leg is crushed, it's crushed. You're out of work. I'm sorry. It sucks. Depression can put you out, but we can do something about that if you, you know, do the right things. Not if we have to ask permission for every gosh darn pill we want to prescribe. Heaven forbid using something like transcranial magnetic stimulation or <gasps> good psychotherapy. Um, but it turns out to stop loss carriers, it makes sense to actually cover some of the cost most of the cost of what it would take to take care of everyone in a company. Right. And it costs the, the patient's families nothing. But in That's, the end, do, but in the end, are they actually making any money out of it? So, yeah. Okay. They, cause so good, it, it, good outcomes for everybody. It's yeah. Yeah. Um, the, it's, it's that level of kind of crazy. Um, that you have to get to to figure, oh, it all makes sense if you follow the thread with the right guides. And, oh, okay, this is a, you know, the Gordian knot can be either untied or just cut, you know, make it quick. It there is be, no spoon. It doesn't have to be so complicated. Is there any way to just to get through this and make it simpler or is so, this just the way it is? So we tried to make it simpler. We've been trying for years by not accepting insurance. And that does make it simpler for psychiatrists. It doesn't make it simpler for people's health. No. And the, the turning point is with the advent of interventional psychiatry, um, transcranial magnetic stimulations, bravado, ketamine, soon psychedelic medicines, um, really effective psychotherapies. We were up against a problem, which was that to pay for those things out of pocket would be cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. And they take teams of people to administer. And so we're looking at what looks more like a neurosurgical OR than a couch. So doing it alone and charging a lot isn't the model that makes sense to actually get people well. Right. Uh, and it's, once we figure that out. Point, I mean, it's, it's after the fact that people have already been diagnosed, right? I mean, you're not getting to a point where... You get to the point where you get, okay, this is what we have to administer, right? But you well, don't talk. About so, so there's some, some technology on the front end too. And right okay. now that technology is time. Spending more time with someone so they can feel understood. Mm -hmm. And you can make sure you get it right. So our average, my average intake in our practice is two hours. Okay. And then you ever, at that seen, point a, you ever, you ever seen a doctor for two hours in a row? No, I don't remember the last time I have. Yeah. Every one of our patients for whom that is appropriate, that's what they get. I've spent six hours doing an intake. Wow. Took that long to figure it out. Well, you are, you are unique. That is different. I've never heard of that from anybody. Well, like if you don't have a diagnosis, what else are you going to do? Yeah. And we were taking the, really the sickest, most treatment, treatment refractory people um, because no one would care for them. And that was, that, that meant something to, to, my, my wife, who's my boss. But it sounds like you're, it sounds like you're like a, a final resort for a lot of people because they must have gone yes. through other things first before they come They've, to you. On average, we are the, uh, the, the, the last stop in the journey to suffering town. Uh, hmm. That people, you know, they've tried all sorts of stuff, right? They've tried the 15 minute visit. They've tried all the medications. Um, they've tried with their insurance. They've tried without their insurance. They've tried scammy wilderness programs. They've tried all sorts of stuff. And what nobody but tried was programs don't work. Are you telling me they don't? <laughs> you, you say smugly. 
<laughs> that's a disingenuous question, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I am. I, that's what I, well, I'm saying there's no evidence that they work. Right. Right. Which well, is different from saying they don't. So, so, so the, the, so you've seen, obviously you've seen an increase, a market increase in all of this since COVID and all that stuff happening, right? We've been busy. Uh, sorry? You've been busy. We've been busy. So, so, but it's still, you're still like at the very end. What, like, is there something that people can do like prior to getting to you and prior yeah. to, sorry? Yeah. I mean, okay. so first off, we had to figure out a way to make it accessible to get, because it's not just me. I have a whole team. I have 70 people on my team. It's huge. Um, we're the, literally like the biggest practice any of the health tech companies we work with have ever encountered, which strikes me as bonkers. But um, so like, how do you find a good doctor, <laughs> right? Um, I, I think the first thing for patients- a dollars question. I, I have no idea. Right. You ask, ask somebody, you ask a friend. Ask, you ask a friend, right? I've, when people, like when I talk to, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal reporters, whatever, one of the questions I asked them at the beginning is like, so if you were suicidal, who would you call? I would have no idea who to right. call. That's insane. <laughs> Well, I know that there's a hotline, but I don't even know how to get to mm -hmm. it. I don't even know what number to dial. If you have right. a stroke, what number do you dial? Uh, 911, of course. Right. And they take you to the hospital and there's a whole protocol, right? They yep. know what to do. Yep. It's yep. guided by evidence. They have large studies to tell us what to do. Aspirin, Blavix, TPA, blah. Within yep. three hours, right? <coughs> Sorry. They got there by gathering data mm -hmm. and doing science. So we have some of the same information. We don't collect it rigorously. And then we have a system that's totally incapable of doing any of the things that might work. I'm actually a speaker at the International uh, Federation for Emergency Medicine this year in what was going to be Dubai, but mm -hmm. sadly will be from home, um, on pediatric behavioral emergencies for emergency medicine docs, because frankly, they're first line most places in the world. Would you call? Would you not call nine one one for the same thing though? I mean, why you couldn't could. you? I, you, you I mean, could. you can. And and what happens? So you're in an emotional crisis, and who shows up? Um, medical personnel. And. Well, fire, cops, the whole shit. Johnny shebang. Law, right? <laughs> That's exactly who you need when you're in emotional crisis, right? I mean. <laughs> and if you're a person of color, you're eight. 15,000 times more likely to die. Wow. Yep. So that's not the right number to call then. And right. the police officers virtually all have PTSD symptoms and half of them have full-fledged PTSD after one of those shootings. So it harms everybody to do it that way. Right. In what world does emotional crisis equal armed warrior? Yeah. Apparently ours. Yeah. Um, before we had, you know, EMS. There was a time when we had coroners and we had doctors. There's nothing in the middle. There didn't need to be because you're either going to die in your way or not. Right? They yeah. got you there and you lived. Okay, the doctors would take care of it. And if you didn't, you're already in the hearse. Yeah. Well, let's turn around. But at 911, is like a, it's like a hammer, right? It's like a bludgeon. Well, it's like developed. everybody, come on, everybody, everybody get, you know, we don't know what the problem is. Just everybody show up. We right? developed a whole climate. system to yeah. take care of medical emergencies. We developed whole new professions. EMS, yeah. EMT, paramedics, flight paramedics. It's a whole array yeah. of professionals that were essentially summoned out of the void of needing to exist. Training yeah. programs were built because it was a thing that was necessary. Once we were yeah. able to keep people alive in the field, we did it. Yeah. And I would argue we need to have the same approach to behavioral health emergencies. But and actually- stopping us from doing this? I mean, it, sound, it cap, sounds capital. so Easy. sensible. Easy, capital. Okay. Right. So they took an entire profession and they kept us out of the insurance game for years. And so we yeah. were private pay. It's a lot of money, dude. It's $800 an hour in New York for someone like right. me. And I'm not even the top of the market. Right. That's a lot. You can just sit on your ass for that. And like, so it sounds like something that, you know, what, 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 Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, what are these multi-billionaires doing? They should be setting something like this up. I mean, it makes sense to me. I would love it if they would invest in that thing. Yes. And that's the argument I'm making, that this makes sense to capital markets, not just goody goodies like myself. Right. So the, the technology is, is really necessary to understand, you know, outcomes and be able to risk stratify and all that good stuff. 
but taking time to help people feel understood and showing up with sense and compassion. If you wanted to kill yourself and someone showed up with a pizza and said, hey, let's talk, probably better. But so that doesn't sound too complicated. And I know that there's some apps out there that allow you to do that sort of thing, you know, through chat and et cetera. It's like, where, where's the disconnect between providing this sort of full full level service and just like the the sparse stuff that we have today? So my my theory is essentially, there are, there are a lot of health tech startups now, and we work with yeah. many of them. Uh, Carlene, my, 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 my wife and my boss, just got uh, appointed to the advisory board at Ozmine. And yeah, my wife's my is, boss too, by the way. Just so. we're in the same boat. <laughs> Um, she's great. I wouldn't want anybody else. She, she's working relentlessly on making the data possible because as much as I'm passionate about this stuff, she is too, but like much more capable. Um, so she's working with Ozmind, which is a general catalyst funded uh, startup that's doing work in high risk, high utilizing patients. She's working with Options MD, which is looking to build the referral source for treatment re resistant depression. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, it's pulling these things together. But what we didn't have practically was a core of doctors in the outpatient setting who took care of high-risk people mm -hmm. because they go to a hospital. You ever been to a psych hospital? No, I have not. Okay. I guess I should say I, thank you, right? Right. They uh, they they exist. Um, so uh, they did a study in Germany, and I'm just going to ask you for your your sense. They looked over 15 years and saw if there was a difference between people who were hospitalized in a locked unit versus an unlocked unit. So the doors would open or the doors would not open. And they looked over 15 years and compared rates of people running away, elopement with locked versus unlocked doors, versus um, they also, I'm sorry, and also they looked at completed suicide after hospitalization. What do you think they saw? So the locked doors versus unlocked doors, I didn't see anybody, I don't see anybody fleeing. They actually run away at the same rate. Really? Well, yep. I thought yeah, either they do or they don't. It's basically a, a yes. it, door, does, door being locked makes no difference. Makes no difference. That's correct. The right. locks and the doors are for the psychiatrists, yeah. not for the patients because they don't keep them in. I mean, you laugh, but there's a consequence to having a locked door, it turns out, mm. which, you know, this is correlation, not causation, but there's more completed suicide after discharge. So immediately after you're discharged from a psychiatric hospital for depression, you are 212 times more likely, times, that's 212,000% more likely to complete suicide. That makes and total then, sense. But why aren't we doing anything about that? I mean, that... That makes total sense that, there, that that's, that's still a problem. It's like leaving the hospital doesn't solve the issue. In the hospital, you're 202,000 percent, 202 times more likely to complete suicide in the hospital. In the hospital. Okay. Yep. So it's not meaningfully modifying the risk of long-term completed suicide. In fact, it increases 30 times for the rest of your life. Jeez. And people don't trip and fall into hospitals. So saying this is like causal is not fair. But if hospitals were doing something useful, those numbers would go the other way. Yeah. Like you go to a hospital because you got in a car crash and you're more likely to live, not less likely to live. Yeah. So this is basically doing the opposite. Bring yeah. them into the hospital makes it worse. Yes. For our nerves, it's good. For our yeah. patients, it's death. Yeah. More often. Than you just, it's almost like you're just protecting everybody around the patient, not the patient themselves. Um, you, I, if that. Which is not to say there aren't times when mental health conditions can be tremendously impairing and hospitalization can be life-saving. It right. can. But counterintuitively, in aggregate, it turns out to not matter a damn whether we hospitalize people or not when it comes to completed suicide rates. Because if you look at like pre and post deinstitutionalization, we had 60,000 people living institutionalized at Pilgrim State Hospital in Long Island. And in well, a is year- it, is, it, is, it the, is it the hospital itself 
that's the problem? Is it a location? Is it taking no. to their current location? I mean, have we done more research on what it is about coming to the hospital that's causing it? So we don't, you, that research is tremendously difficult to do. Okay. Because you're not randomizing people to determine causality. And so there are limits of the studies we can do. But I can tell you that it turns out to not matter. Like the rate of hospitalization doesn't change the rate of completed suicide. So whether you have 60,000 people in a hospital or 400 people in a hospital, same hospital, people are st right. still somewhere. Right. There's no difference in the suicide rate. In fact, it's going up. No, we know, it, we know that does it, but we don't know whether it's being in a hospital or being somewhere other than where they live, right? We don't know what's causing the extra, the, the, the we, numbers to go up. We do know that these are not benign interventions. Right. And, and yet we regularly hospitalize people thinking about it as safe and not thinking about the long-term consequences. I'm worried you might kill yourself. So I'm going to take away our autonomy and put you someplace you don't want to be. Okay. Well, we know that doesn't work, but is there something that we know works? Yeah. So okay. there, are, there are a number of things. We just don't do them on average. Now, in other places, this is not entirely true. In the UK, for example, where I trained in psychotherapy, um, they basically don't hospitalize chronically suicidal people. Mm -hmm. uh, they have outpatient treatment with something called mentalization-based treatment or MBT. Um, that is really effective for people who are chronically suicidal. And they make therapy available for all of their citizens relatively easily. So what do they do? Does somebody go to their home and talk to them or? If they need it, yeah. And that's the, the Ambit teams I mentioned at the beginning. That was our inspiration because they had teams right. for hard to reach, hard to teach individuals, mostly kids. Kids who are more likely to tell you, go F yourself than help me. Right. They didn't trust help because it hadn't been helpful. They're not right. wrong, right? We just talked about how unhelpful those approaches are. And so the, right. you know, the people who are reject, help rejecting, it's for a reason. And taking that seriously and seeing what happens if you do things differently has been our approach. And it turns out the data is bonkers. We reduce hospitalization by 98%. Wow. So you send, so, the, so what's the overall concept here? You send a team, like when you know there's a problem, like what, what's what's the dream situation here? There's a phone number you call and a team comes in and what happens? The dream situation is you start with an assessment that is going to have a chance of getting it right. Okay. And right now that means time. In the future, that will mean less time and more technology. And you, you can have, use leverage technology to reduce the amount of time and manpower to get the work done? Yeah. It turns out that the key element in being able to change your mind about wanting to live or die is trust. Hmm. And if you have more trusting relationships, you're less likely to want to kill yourself, less likely to need to go to a psychiatrist, less likely to need to go to a hospital. Learning how to trust again for people who've lost that ability is the secret sauce. And when you and combine that with- early with your family or friends, it's with anyone really. Right. It's, so the, the treatment is designed to help you learn how to trust again. And that can be with the family and friends in your life. And those are the people for whom it's most likely uh, to be helpful. And then you expand from there. For, for most of us, we have relationships that are beyond our family. We've got friends. Turns out friends are really important. Not everyone has friends. Yeah. And, and friends really can keep hold you together, man. Good mm -hmm. coworkers. A boss who understands you like your wife. <laughs> um, yeah, but those, those relationships where you can, when someone can tell you something and you can believe them, even if it's hard. Yeah. Because you trust them to tell you the truth. That's what a lot of people are missing. So it's the and, trust yeah. in the, the, the people who are around you that is the key factor, not just having people around you. Because there's people who say, oh, I have all these friends, but they don't all really. All these friends. But, yeah. I don't, but they don't understand me. Right. And so it's the ability to feel understood, to hold on to the sense that other people might be thinking about you in ways you haven't, you don't know for sure. The example of this is whenever you get, you know, the text message and, and, and you tend to send something like a really important text, then you get dot, dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> ah! <laughs> what are they going to say? Okay. 
<laughs> and and our minds in that moment do this thing where right my yeah. other favorite example of this and this is uh this whole i was doing a talk and i i came into a breakout room and everyone had their screen off and they were muted mm-hmm Okay. Feels really uncomfortable, right? Yeah, yeah. You you lose access to the other person's mind. Yeah. That's yeah, what it's like that's for that's our patients. One day. So I, I'm doing my yeah. Stanford MBA. We did that as an exercise the other day where we actually changed our modalities. We said, okay, just do it audio, do it audio video, then just do it audio, and then just do it through chat. And it was like, it was so different, these different, like communicating through these different modalities. It's just, it feels like night and day. But and it turns out, yes, right? Um, but that, that same thing you demonstrated to yourself happens in the minds of people who are suffering. Right. And so they, their minds will go, lose access to you in that way. And right. so n- normally they, you know, they still see you. It's like the camera goes off. But mm-hmm. their ability to understand what you might be thinking in moments of distress can be totally taken away. And that right. leads to panic. And all sorts of crazy behavior. So would you say that it sounds to me that you're also saying that social media is making this way worse, like way, 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 way worse. I mean, making it way worse is a statement that would require extraordinary evidence. Okay. Uh, Do I think we have the smartest people on earth spending all their time learning how to make us spend two more seconds on Instagram? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do I think that's the best use of their time? No. Do I wish they were using it to more pro-social ends? Yes. But they're disconnecting. I mean, I think they're one of the pieces they're trying to do is disconnect people. It does disconnect people. It doesn't really connect people. There's not more connection going on because of what's happening in social media. There's less. So I would look at something like Clubhouse, which is the audio chat app, right? Where I think people actually feel less lonely, not more lonely. Yeah. No, it's the I would first agree. time I would agree I've seen that. that. But, but audio has that special, there's something special about audio that makes it more, feel more intimate. And that's why this is a podcast. And so some people watch the video and see how handsome we are and others won't. And we'll just have to imagine from the the tenor of our voices that we're the, just really the best. Um, (laughs) But you know, you're forgiven from knowing that me in the deep fake, no worries. Oh, not a problem. (laughs) That's, you know, it's, it, I'm trying to do a line from star Wars. I'm totally going to whiff it. Um, so I'm not even gonna bother. Uh, ugh, right. But that, that, that feeling of being more or less connected matters. Yeah. And we spend a lot of time making design decisions to make people feel less connected. Some people are more vulnerable to that than others. Yeah. Well, and it's true. I mean, and, and I, I mean, that has contributed has totally contributed to the problem that we have. It's not just the isolation that we have where we can't actually see people or touch people. It's like we can't see or touch people even through through these dev- through these uh, interfaces. I know, right? Um, yeah. It is. It, it is a, the problem is the people who are you know growing up now. Um, this is the standard for them. They never did the stuff that we did without the phones. And feeling disconnected is normal. Um, And so if you're wondering why substance use rates are going up and if you feel worse, yeah. yeah. So when you're talking about genuine Ness, are you talking about that character from Earthbound or I'm not quite sure what you meant by- I have no idea what what Earthbound is. I'm gonna totally, (laughs) totally reveal myself to be uncool here. No idea. Is that like some- you know the Nintendo character, the kid with the baseball cap, Ness? No? Okay, never mind. <laughs> I know, right? Like, if it wasn't Legend of Zelda, like the original, I'm dead. <laughs> I got nothing for you. So, so, so tell me, you got in here, tell me, you talk about the value of absurdity. Now, I yes. love absurdity myself. I, I just <laughs> love it. Like, I've been, like, for example, my wife and I were watching uh, Community. We were, we were binge watching Community, right? You remember, you, you've watched Community, right? I have watched me like once. I don't watch a lot of TV. Okay. And then as you go, as it progressed, it got more and more and more absurd. And mm-hmm. I'd be sitting there laughing like crazy. And she's like, wow, this is, this is insane. And of course, the more absurd it got, the, the more I loved it. 
What were you, when you talked about the value of absurdity, what do you, what do you mean? So what I mean is there are a lot of times when, uh, when people are feeling that, that disconnection, that panic and getting mm -hmm. through to them is hard because importantly, we talked about trust. If someone isn't trusting in that moment, saying something genuine sounds like a lie. Right. Hey, are you okay? Why are you lying to me? You don't really care. I know. I know you don't really care. My mistrust radar is up, and you are full of crap. Yeah. yeah. Doctor, you're just here for the money. Well, ninety-nine percent of the time, when somebody asks if you're okay, they don't really care. They right? don't want to know the answer, right? <laughs> and so, how do you how do you get someone back to a place where they can consider whether you might have something to say that's relevant to them? Right. And one of the ways of doing that is by presenting them with information that makes no effing sense at all. Right. So. When someone's, you know, curled up in a ball, and, you know, ah, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Yeah. Cowabunga. <laughs> what? No, I mean, it's not weird. Like, yeah. why, why no. did I even say that? It's like breaking, <laughs> it's like breaking the pattern, like something totally unexpected. Right. And you have to just push it in there. I love it. So the unexpected trips our brain up. And gives us that moment as we're getting ourselves back up from absurdity, going, hold on, what's happening here? Where we're able to hear and feel understood in a way that we're usually guarded against. And so, you know, fear, mistrust, plus laughter equals opportunity. So let me ask you something. Yeah. Do, do you think it's possible to build a diagnostic tool that we embed into our social media that can detect if someone's heading down the wrong direction and do some kind of an intervention. It's already happening. My okay. colleagues, uh, Leo Lopez, uh, Michael Birnbaum, Chris Carell, John Kane um, at, at Northwell, they've been building that with James Pennebaker for years. And mm -hmm. they have data on people with psychosis and early identification of that just from YouTube comments, Facebook posts, et cetera. So our language is a brain scan. And people are building those, you know, they're not diagnostic tools, but they are assessment tools that we can use to target ads for help. Right. But we can, have we taken it, like, where does that, where does that sit today? I mean, is it working? Is it's, it up, it's, it's up not, it, it's, it's research only. Okay. So do you foresee a point where we can take what's there and not just do the intervention, but actually, you know, massage them back into something a little more uh, normal based on what we've seen. So we've got these outputs, we've got the data, we see what direction they're going in. Can we, can we help them at the same time? And so I would argue, yes. And also that's going to cost money. So right. it's got to make money for somebody okay. for us Warren to do it. Bill Gates, come on, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> but I think if we, we can't rely on charity. Right. Relying on charity gets you, you know, Rockefeller University, but not much else. If you took, for over the last 10 years, if you took one half of 1% of the equity of every company that went through Y Combinator, you would have enough money right now to endow the mental health care spend for everyone in America. Wow. The interest on the money would pay for the entire spend of everyone annually. So including stakeholders in the growth that our, you know, economy builds, including people who, who need it, right? and they work for those companies. Like you got to you gotta be a little grandiose to think you can do something like that. And with yeah. that can come vulnerability, right? Yeah. We call that narcissistic is, personality disorder. Why, why are we not doing this? What's stopping us? Turns out, like, how long did it take me to explain that to you until you could buy that statement? I mean, like, it's not it's, a thirty. It's not a thirty-second elevator pitch. Is that's what's is that what's holding it back? We just have to ideate a thirty-second elevator pitch, and then boom, we're we're in. So, I, I it it's it's not it just anything is probably going to get you in trouble. But I do think it's possible to make a concise argument for these things to people for whom it could make plenty of money, and that's what they care about. And once people with money care about it. Then you don't have to worry about people really caring because like they care in the same way they care that Geico makes money as an auto insurance company. Yeah. Deeply. <laughs> it's really important. They're going to, they're going to optimize that stuff. Whereas if what you give them to care about is that it costs more every year for every person to get healthcare in this country, you're going to get that. 
Yeah. Well, we then get we, what we pay you for. See the graphs right now, right? I mean, there is no end in sight. Yeah, because there's no reason to have an end in sight. There's yeah. only a reason to make it go up for the shareholders of United Healthcare, for example. Yeah. Which is now the I was talking to somebody uh, from the healthcare field like a, a bunch of shows ago, and he's like, there's just too much money in American healthcare. There's just too much floating around. And it's like, how come we can't get grab some of that and use it for this purpose? Because we made it legal to have kickbacks. Like when, when Giuliani broke up the five families, they didn't go away. Yeah. <laughs> they went to healthcare. That's right. And they use the same the same things, but they got it to be legal. Yeah. So let's say everything comes back to the law, right? I mean, the lawmakers, we we've we've had them do it. Where is where's we the most have, money in US healthcare? The what's biggest that? part, what's the biggest spend in the healthcare industry? Oh, no idea. Take a guess. I don't know, insurance? Nope. Uh, no, I have no idea. Pharmacy benefit managers. What? Who's a farm? What's a pharmacy benefit manager? I don't <laughs> exactly. Know what that is. Right. So by making it boring, like unbelievably boring, they've <laughs> managed to hide. Do they get paid a lot of money? Is that what you're saying? Should I do that for a living? <laughs> pharmacy benefit management, which puts drugs into tiers and moves rebates from one place to another, which are kickbacks, but legal is over $400 billion every year. Oh, so that's where all the money's going. Yes. <sighs> and it's so boring, you've never heard about it. Oh, man. Sounds lucrative, though. It's like- It's extremely stuff lucrative. lucrative. Stuff is very boring. Yes. <laughs> it's, and by making it very boring, we all fall asleep halfway through the explanation. Mm. And that mm -hmm. means no one's ever going to catch them. Because we just go, this is complicated. Those doctors are greedy. Yeah. <laughs> They're probably getting a kickback. But yeah, we're not. <laughs> but plenty of people are. Those kickbacks are pretty sweet. What well, is it true that the reason why nothing changes? It's like I've, I've been in all these, I've been in corporate innovation groups. I've been in all these in all companies, uh, government, et cetera. It's like, it seems like there's always people complaining about these problems, but they never seem to go away. And the reason they never seem to go away is there's somebody who likes it like that, right? A lot they of like people it like that, like and like that's that. why it's not changing. There's there's hundreds of billions of dollars in liking it like that. Yeah, yeah. And would you give that up? Yeah, well, no. I mean, wh wh what do you call that? Is that corruption? You said it, not me. <laughs> I didn't accuse any of my wonderful colleagues. At I'm not. Blue I'm Cross not accusing United anybody. Signer, I'm, just, I'm just saying that you know. I, it just seems to me that when things are really bad and it, they'd never change and they stay that way, there seems to be no, there's not an impetus to make a change or so, something's, something's pushing back against the change. Right. Pablo Escobar got to build his own prison. Yeah. La, what was it? La Cathedral or whatever it was. He, he could, mm -hmm. they, they had, there's no reason when you paid off everybody. Um, to do something about it, unless you're a dangerous lunatic like myself. And yeah. uh, that's going to be taken out of context in a second. The world needs more dangerous lunatics. Dangerous but lunatics I, are the ones who, you know, get the job done eventually. I'll go with iconoclast um, or, or nerd. But have you heard this explanation of how it works before? Never. This really? is old. This, this is, is new to you. Yeah. You're rolling with it yeah. like, like it's not like you had some set. No? <laughs> really? No, it's nuts. I mean, I'm just saying that the, the, the concept of stuff always, there's so many people who complain about so much mm -hmm. and then nothing ever ha changes. Nothing ever happens. And the reason why nothing ever happens is because people like it. There's too many people who like it the way it is. And there are too many explanations that are simple and incorrect for people to get upset about. Right. But then doctors the are greedy. Occurs unless some crisis were to trigger it. I mean, it's the same like what's happening with COVID. And, and, and so many crises, so many changes never happen unless there's a crisis. So what kind of crisis do we need to make this happen? COVID-19. And it's happening? It's happening. So when did, when did Shakespeare write his best work, King Lear? The Globe Theater was closed during the plague. Mm -hmm. When did we invent calculus? 
Isaac Newton was living with his mom in the country for 18 months because he had to get out of town because of the plague. Right. Um, the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith was written during the plague of 1776. He had to get out of town. Had nothing to do but write a 700-page so economics book. Is that COVID-19 is going to be is going to spawn a ton of innovation that we haven't even we haven't even imagined yet. Plagues change things. Right. They always have, and they will continue to. That's my contention. And if anything's going to change stuff, it's the tectonic shifts that happen with a plague. Right. So really, this is the best time to leverage this to make great change occur. You betcha. I love it. So where are we going to be in 10 years? Tell me, the year 2031. <sighs> um, in another plague. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you think there's going to be another not. one? Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, no, no, there's going to be another one, but is it going to be as bad as this one? Is it going to be, be worse. disruptive enough? It'll be it, easily. It's going to be worse. Really? Yeah. And why? Why is it going to be worse? What? What's going to make it worse? Uh, because this is not as bad as it gets, right? No, uh, of Ebola not. is much more fatal. Oh yeah, there's 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 a lot worse out there. I I mean I was shocked. I live in New York City where COVID first blew up, essentially in the U.S., and I was shocked that more people didn't die. Yeah. Like I made a po I've been making a podcast about this the whole time. And mm -hmm. I, I made a podcast, you know, a couple in the beginning where it's like the wave is coming. It's going to be 53,000 people dead, you know? Yeah. Um, didn't happen. Not quite. Um, could well, we that over, happen? We yeah. overestimated the – didn't we overestimate the survivability or the underestimate the survivability? We got a lot of numbers wrong. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we modified some in ways we didn't expect and others we did a worse job of. Um, so this is bad and economically disastrous, but it's not as deadly as it could be. Yeah. And it would, you know, it's going to cost real money to prevent their, the next plague. You have to actually care about people who we don't care about now. But if we, okay, if we prevent the plague, so, so, so let's, let's project. Yep. 2031, 10 years from now, are we going to be in the middle of another plague? Are we going to be back to smooth sailing? Is everyone going to be back to normal? What, where are we going to be? Um, oh, I hope I'm going to be in uh, somewhere nice, drinking some non-alcoholic beverage, maybe 40 pounds lighter because I've gotten enough exercise. Uh, there will have been advances in healthcare that let me sit back and let an AI version of me uh, be therapeutic across the board for people who desperately need it. Right. So this could be like hundreds oh, you're, of versions you're of therapists. you working on something like that, aren't you? Yeah. I think it starts with payment models because until, right. until we can get it to be worthwhile to someone who's actually going to care about the money part, I don't think it works. I don't think you can well, count on like, people's okay, goodwill. Something like Uber and Airbnb, they just like pushed in. I mean, it wasn't legal to do a lot of the stuff that they're doing. Is there any way we can just push in to this, to this market and do stuff that's not necessarily legal, but still effective? So uh, it in healthcare, Doing stuff that's not necessarily legal is a bad idea because we have okay. licensing boards. We can do things that are not reimbursed mm -hmm. traditionally and so figure out ways around them. If they pay for it themselves, they can do it. No. Okay. That, there's not enough money in that. I think we need disruptive investment. Investment that looks at the system and goes, just like they do with Uber, right? Cabs are not the best way to handle this isn't the best technology forever to go somewhere right. um and so you know what how do what what is uber what's their business well they're uh they're not a they're not a car company they're more of a uh a ride sharing right so it's i've got what's, what's the technology cars mm -hmm. it's a marketplace yep it's a marketplace. It connects demand with supply in a way that comes up with a price that is makes it make sense to have more people drive when there's more demand. Yeah. They fixed a market problem. Why is your copay $20 all the time? Whether you're sick or well, whether you need it or don't, same amount. I have no idea. I thought copays were just a, a nuisance amount to keep, keep people from <laughs> using the system too often. It turns out that you keeping people from using the system too often is not always a good idea. 
No, Some but people, I thought that copay is what for. They were for yeah, it is, it is what they're for. But that's like that's like saying every car ride should be ten dollars. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not. It makes no sense. But I mean, it, it is there to reduce usage. Unlike, I mean, I, I'm originally from Canada, so I know the Canadian healthcare system. Plenty of people just go to the doctor to talk. They don't want to be diagnosed with anything. They just they just want somebody to listen, and they don't pay anything, right? There's no copay, so you know. There's lots of doctors who are overloaded with with appointments, and that's why it takes forever to get an MRI. But but there's it, dynamic so, the, like there, it used to take forever to get a cap. Now I can get an Uber in under ten minutes. Yeah. So it's not that's that different. There's, is there a solution? Uh, yeah. The payment models and care. So we we got to build Uber for healthcare. Right. In that we need to get people to places they didn't know they needed to go. <laughs> it's a little bit different. Um, the cars need to drive better and safer, and they have to come when you need them, where you need them, and it has to generate value for the right people. So is it as simple as a, like an Uber for therapy? Um, when you say simple, Uber is not simple. Uber is tremendously complicated. No, no I mean, the, but the overall concept is like connecting, you know, teams. I think it's probably closer. Yes, with, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if driving was a team sport. Then, right. then that's a, that's fair. I think looking at it like Tesla, so Tesla built their first thing, an electric car, but they put a bunch of sensors and cameras in it. So it turns out they own 95% of the data on autonomous driving mm -hmm. because they have 500,000 scanners on the road that people have paid for and are driving around. Yeah. And, and I think we would need to do the same thing with therapy and then build the dynamic pricing models that distribute the cost and value to the people to whom it makes the most sense in a way that incentivizes people to do good, difficult work and innovate. I love it. I want to sign up, but I don't have any money. <laughs> you just need the big, you need the big bucks for this, right? Um, the big bucks are going to help um, a lot because that that's how, you know, for Uber to work, right? They had to tolerate, I probably to this day, I don't even know if they've still made a penny like in profit. It's worth $60 billion, but it's never made a profit. Yeah. Because they want to own the entire network worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. All the cars, right? And that's an investment. Well, at, we have to look at this in the same way is that yep. it doesn't necessarily pull a profit, but you think of the upside, the good it'll do, it's just synonymous. So, SoftBank has this hypothesis that if you dump tons of money into a market, and look, I don't know if they're right, but you can just own the whole market. There are only 38,000 psychiatrists in the U.S. Mm. You could employ all of them. I didn't realize there were to. so few. That's mm -hmm. insane. Yep. Only about 6,500 practicing child psychiatrists. You could just roll it all up if you, if you had yeah. billions and millions. Yeah. The entire market for transcranial magnetic stimulation is $818 million wow. in size. So for comparison, uh, psychedelic drug development company MindMed is worth over a billion. And they've never made a drug yet. Wow. Amazing. So, Amazing. Well, we're out of time. This has been great. I love talking to you. This is, this is fantastic. I, I hope we it was fun. This problem, man. We have to solve this problem. <laughs> Every day. And it's because people are suffering. Yeah. That's yeah. what we have to remember, that there are people whose lives are devastated if we don't take this as seriously as we do getting from point A to point B. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm totally with you. And I agree 100%. We, this is something we absolutely need to work on. We absolutely need to do. So I'm going to put your bio and contact information in the show notes. Anything else you want to add? Um, understanding misunderstandings is where it's at. Um, so the next time you get the dot, dot, dot in your life, imagine maybe they're thinking about what to say because they're thinking about me, not, oh my God, they're going to hate me. Uh, exactly. And you'll find when you replace exclamation points with question marks, things in your life get easier. Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. It was great talking Thank with you. you. Talk to you soon.